Whether you operate one forklift or thousands, one location or hundreds, the new My Toyota customer portal can help you optimize your operation and material handling equipment. This one-stop, free-to-use platform is designed to help you take control of your information and make smarter decisions, all at the touch of a button. Register and access your data today at my.toyotaforklift.com. That's my.toyotaforklift.com. Hi, this is John Hayes from Balio, and you're listening to the New Warehouse Podcast. And today's safety tip is... Always be aware of your surroundings when in the warehouse. Had a brief example the other day. I was in a warehouse and totally lost focus and nearly walked out in front of a forklift. And these are very large, very fast pieces of equipment that can hurt you. So always take your time, understand your surroundings, and be safe. With e-commerce off the charts, many small and growing warehouses are asking, how can I get ahead when my warehouse is barely keeping up? The answer is future-ready warehouse tech from Zebra Technologies. Warehouses can simplify and upgrade all processes, from automated inventory management to hands-free picking, with Zebra's tailored, scalable mobile solutions. They're simple and intuitive. There's never been a better time to upgrade for success with Zebra. How can your warehouse get ahead? The answer's in black and white. Get the answers at zebra.com slash the answer. That's zebra.com slash the answer. The New Warehouse Podcast, hosted by Kevin Lawton, is your source for insights and ideas from the distribution, transportation, and logistics industry. A new episode every Monday morning brings you the latest from industry experts and thought leaders. And now, here's Kevin. Hey, it's Kevin Lawton with the New Warehouse Podcast, bringing you a new episode today. And on today's episode, I am going to be joined by John Hayes, who is the Director of Sales over at Balio. And Balio is a robotics company, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about what they do and what their focus is on as a robotics company. As we know, there's many, many out there. So he's going to tell us a little bit about what they're focused on, how companies can address some space utilization issues by using VNA. We're going to find out what that stands for and and what that actually means. So John's going to help us get through that and, and understand those things a little bit better. So John, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you very much. Doing quite well, Kevin. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate the time today. Definitely happy to have you on, happy to learn more about Balio and what it is you guys do. So why don't you give us a, a brief overview of Balio? Sure. Well, Balio is an automation company. Okay. We started out life many years ago as a AGV AMR kind of software company and mm-hmm. developed a hardware and software package to automate fork trucks. So our, our equipment literally turns manual forklifts into automated forklifts. Okay. And, you know, we're in the the business of integrating and automating material movement, both horizontal and vertical in, in transport solutions. Think forklifts without people. Yeah. And that kind of rationalizes what we do in a nutshell. All right. And I'm curious too, before we dive a little deeper, you know, Balio, where, where does the name come from? It's, a, it's an interesting name. <laughs> You know, that's an interesting question, and I wish I knew the answer. It, it's obviously the name of our company. We are a French company, so I'm mm-hmm. assuming that it's it's of French origin. And, you know, I guess I should know that because it seems like a fairly common question. But the answer <laughs> is I just don't know. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a little catchy. Uh, I like it. So so Thank now you. You, you talked about taking manual forklifts, basically, and making them automated. So, uh, I mean, it, it seems like a complex problem, but I'm, I'm curious, you know, how does Balio kind of take this uh, complex problem, which really addressing a lot of different issues that we see in the supply chain space, especially, you know, the m- most recently labor shortage and things of that nature. But how do, you, how do you take that complex problem and, and how do you make it into a, a simple solution with Balio? You know, it's, it's, it's a good question. And I've been doing this for so many years 
that I, I tend to try to boil everything down to the simplest solution or the mm. simplest discussion that we can have with respect to that. You know, the, the technology in and of itself is super high tech and continues mm. to expand, not just our equipment, but everybody's equipment. There's, there's new tech every day, new sensor base, those sorts of things. Mm. But, you know, at the base level, once you have the tech in place, the, the real key is simplifying it down to movement of material from point A to point B, which is really what right. we do. But the, the, the pain points that we're really starting to deal with, you know, I started in 1992, so it's been a long time. Mm. And this was black magic back then, and we always sold it on ROI. So yeah. it was a situation where I would come to you, Kevin, and say, look, I can save you X number of dollars and yeah, 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 fine. But it was so new that it was very, you know, people weren't really vested in the solution. That has changed so dramatically recently with the fact that that labor is nearly impossible to come by. Right. And it, it's getting worse still. And so the key for us is automating the low hanging fruit, which is horizontal transportation pallets mm -hmm. from, you know, in, in, you know, you being a warehouse person, understanding your inbounding. Yep. from the dock door into the the warehouse itself, into the rack. Or if you have manufacturing tied to it, maybe you're taking directly from, you know, maybe the end of a conveyor from a manufacturing line and then taking it into the warehouse. Yeah. And for ages, AGV providers have just been providing that um, service, the service of the horizontal transport. Mm. What Balio has found, and there's an interesting story, that the vertical aspect was something that was really uncharted or not well covered in the industry. So right. Valio, along with their partners, have put together a VNA mm. application. So very narrow aisle right. fork truck. So typically turret trucks that operate in 72 inch wide aisle. So when you yeah. push the aisles closer together, obviously you're getting better space utilization. Doing that aut automatically and autonomously as well as a reach truck. So your more traditional warehousing applications where, you know, you might have that horizontal transportation from the dock door. But if you think your your retail type applications or your e-tail type applications where mm -hmm. you use this reach truck to put the pallets away in, you know, five, six meter high racking yeah. and then pull it back down either to pick on the floor or to go back to the dock you know, the technology just wasn't there five years ago to do that reliably. And now the tech is there. And we're finding that those are the applications that are the hardest to fill mm. in the warehousing world. And Definitely. not only that, we're also finding based on an interesting turn of fate mm. that we needed this um, as well. And what I mean by that is we recently opened a really a 3PL concept for us in Paris, where our, okay. our headquarters is located. Yeah. And we're working with a, a, a third party logistics company and we are the transportation arm of that 3PL. Hmm. And we thought that we should do the very same thing here because you think it's a great way for us to have some revenue. So we're, we're actually a part of an operating facility, hmm. but we partner with a 3PL or a warehousing company and we have the ability to bring potential customers in to actually put their hands on it and they wow. can test product. Like you could send us a pallet of your product and we could yeah. put it away and take it out of the rack and show you that we can do it. But we tried very hard to find some space. You know, we didn't mm -hmm. need a million square feet. You know, if you did, you'd have to go buy something or have it built. Yeah. We really needed maybe between 50 and a hundred thousand square feet. And we reached out all over the United States trying to find a place just to kind of put this concept yeah. and, you know, commercial real estate agents were very blunt in that those spaces are just super hard to find because there are many, many companies out there that are doing this, but not doing the automation part, but looking for that size space. Yeah. And, you know, the thought occurred to us, so it's not just us, it's not just the end user, it's also us and the ability to utilize the rack space above. So mm. be able to have customers, compress their warehouses, go up with them, whether it's a narrow aisle yeah. or whether it's a very narrow aisle, 
the technology is allowing for us to solve a very real problem. And it's actually two problems. Number one is space utilization, finding space or recrafting your existing space by pushing things closer together. Mm. And then number two, just finding people to, to drive forklifts is, is becoming very onerous yeah. um, and expensive. Yeah. So the paradigm has shifted from one of, hey, you should buy this because it's going to save you money to one of not only that, but people don't really want to drive forklifts anymore. And when they do, it's it's a situation where they can make more money, whether it's a quarter, a dollar or two dollars just down the street with the quote unquote Amazon effect of warehouses popping up all over the place. Mm. It's also easy to lose employees just as easy as it is or hard as it is to find them. It's easy to lose them too. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, it's a great thing that we're we're getting to this point in the technology phase because, you know, just like you're talking about it, I've experienced, you know, personally um, having difficulties finding reach operators and, you know, it's, you know, difficult, for a long time, finding just during the pandemic, any, any type of labor. But then when things started to open up a little more, you know, is easy to find material handlers, you know, that can, you know, do unloading, wrapping, strapping, those types of things. But then to find people that can operate the equipment and find skilled operators within, you know, budget is very, very difficult to do. Cause as you said, you know, where, where I'm at, it's so densely populated with warehouses and, you know, a lot of the big players are there, like the Amazon you mentioned and Wayfair and Home Depot and exactly, uh, right. Petco offering crazy sign on bonuses and all these different things. It's, it's hard to compete as a, you know, a smaller, smaller player in a sense in, in comparison to those guys so so it's good that you guys are addressing this issue and I, I love the concept of you know the customer having a place where they can actually like get their get their hands on with it and especially with their own product and see how it really works and in that setting and then be able to you know kind of i guess pair the you know the visual with the the mental side as well and be able to really put those together so so i think it's an interesting thing and i, I want to take a, a step back because it, you mentioned yeah. that you're taking the manual forklift and making it automated so now in that sense does that mean that you are taking forklifts that a company would already have in their existing fleet and automating those, or you're creating your own hardware and then delivering that to the customer. So, you know, it's, it's interesting because the early days of these concepts, mm-hmm. it was to have nothing more than the hardware that you would sell to a, an end user yeah, and they would integrate it into a piece of equipment. And that would be really a retrofit situation. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that there are many companies that do that any longer. Right. However, there are companies um, like ours, which do take the OEM equipment. We really now only deal with integrating the equipment on a new piece of okay. um, OEM equipment, like a VNA truck or a reach truck or a counterbalance truck. Yeah. What, what I think we found is that when you message that you can put it on any truck, mm. your R and D budget, the, and the ability to control the risks associated with what you might be getting into Mm -hmm. really became onerous on our side. So no, we don't put it on any trucks any longer, but we do still put it on that Heister Yale chassis. Mm -hmm. So we work with Heister Yale in the U S as well as the Lindy chassis in Mm -hmm. Europe, as well as some here in the U S for the, their entire product line with respect to a tugger, Mm. a pallet jack, a counterbalance forklift, a reach truck, and a VNA truck. So we're literally touching every segment of that product line for horizontal and vertical transport. Mm. But we don't offer any more the ability to just to take the hardware and put it on any truck. I think that was blue sky in the early stages of agv and people really wanted to do that. But yeah. I think that what it, what it's landed back on is – it's still the same truck that you're familiar with. You can still get on it and drive it, but it's just safer to buy it from new and get the warranties and everything associated with it. Mm. Okay. Makes sense. And so I was curious about that and I wanted to get some clarification. So now we you mentioned in there, the, the VNA and a very, very narrow aisle and what that means. So, so when we look at the very narrow aisle and obviously, 
you know, you mentioned that it's it's difficult to find smaller spaces for companies. So, so sometimes you know what we're finding is that companies are running into space utilization problems. Maybe not all year round. Maybe it's just you know at certain points of the year they need some overflow space, and and to find those smaller spaces is a difficult thing. So you know when we talk about VNA and say a company wants to better utilize their space and they want to grow, whether it's they want to compact their aisles or they want to go higher, closer to the ceiling and take advantage of the upward space as well. You know, what what can people expect in undertaking a, a project like that? And, and how does that kind of unfold to get to the point where now you can bring in Balio and, and put that in place as well with the VNA? It's, it's actually surprisingly simple. If you start from Greenfield, Right. And if you don't already have a VNA truck in house and you don't have oh. the infrastructure for it, then it's a little more difficult simply because when you're dealing with VNA trucks, um, not only have you compressed the space in the aisle width, yeah. you also want to benefit from as much free space up as you can possibly get. And that translates directly to the pain that you feel if your floor is not flat. Mm. So uh, first things first, you got to get your floor flat. Yeah. Not not incredibly difficult. There are companies that will come in and grind the floor for just your aisles. You don't need to fix everything, but you do need the floor flat yeah. for the VNA truck. However, if you've already got a VNA truck, then it's much uh, much easier mm. in that it's really a process simply of coming in and putting the controls on the the vehicle, bringing in a new vehicle, and mapping out the pick and drop locations. And what makes that easier for us, as opposed to a, a, a more traditional application, is their rack. Mm. They're bolted to the floor. Things don't move, right? Yeah. So that's that makes it really easy. And it also makes checkout and implementation automatable on our side as well. The other things that are gotchas that you want to look for are just charging. It's mm. the one thing that that, you know, you want to have an automated system, but in general, with VNA trucks, since of, due to their size, the batteries are large and difficult to move around. So you most of the time can still utilize the same charge uh, systems and battery swap equipment that you have. But you want to, if you're buying an automated system, in many cases, you do want to automate the charging process as well. Yeah, And, you know, we offer, and I think everybody does, an automated charging system where the vehicle can go to a charger and just sit and charge. Mm-hmm. The, the great thing about VNA trucks is that since everything is static and bolted to the floor, and one of the things that you see with most AGV systems is the challenge of it operating in a high traffic area. Yeah. Right. Think think your forklifts driving through your warehouse. There are a lot of people walking around. There are other fork trucks. There's maybe pallet jacks that are doing picking while reach trucks are doing replan or mm-hmm. putting away. So you have that traffic to deal with. With VNA applications, you have none of that because you have just completely automated the entire box. And generally, when you talk to people about this, the thing that makes them kind of go, ah, I get it is you really think of these as an ASRS or, a, you know, an mm-hmm. automated storage retrieval system where there's a crane operating in an aisle, right. but you don't have the cost associated with the infrastructure of the ASRS. So it fits very nicely between uh, a fully manual system where you have people in driving these vehicles. And I don't know if you've ever done it, but I'm going to ask you, Kevin, have you ever sure. been on a, a VNA truck, you know, 30 feet in the air, picking loads? Have you done that before? I've never done that before. I have been inside of the top of an ASRS tower before. Okay, so it's, it's much the same, except generally <laughs> yeah. ASRSs are also top mounted, right? Mm. VNA trucks are, you know, they're they're floor based pieces of equipment, and they move around like mad, mm. and it's it's scary. It's a scary job. So mm. I can understand where it's one of those jobs where, you know, in some ways people are happy to get off that vehicle. So, it, you know, it's a, it's kind of a net positive everywhere. Mm-hmm. You get the, the you, you get to compress your storage space. You get to go as high as you possibly can. Obviously buildings that are taller get more benefit because mm-hmm. it's free space. And there's very little drawback if you already do it. If you don't do it, the things that you simply need to, to, to understand are the floor becomes your, 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 the, the biggest item of interest with you because the flatter it is, 
um, the better the truck will be, especially when yeah. you're talking, you know, 15 meters and the truck is, you know, off a little bit one way or the other, it becomes yeah. very difficult to deal with. But functionally, not an awful lot to it. Same thing with reach trucks, really. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I was curious about that, you know, as we try and address some issues and, and companies are looking to, to maximize the utilization of what's really involved in it and kind of taking those next steps. So, so thank you for sharing that. And, uh, you know, I oh, think- you're welcome. Yeah, You're welcome. One of the things that you do find, though, mm-hmm. and this is is just due to the size of the truck, it is an expensive solution. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it can be very expensive solution. But the trade off simply is, you know, more space and less labor. Yeah. And typically more throughput. Mm-hmm. Typically, that's what you're dealing with because the system can work 24 seven. Yeah. You, you do not need people there. And, then, you know, most distribution is what, eight hours in, eight hours out with some overlap in the middle. Yeah. When you put an automated system in like this, you can run it twenty four seven. Even if even if you're just adjusting your placement of loads to make it more efficient for the next day, so there's mm. there's a lot of net benefit for it. Interesting, yeah, yeah, it's interesting, and I, I think that's one of the benefits of the the automation robotics is that you know the robot never gets tired, right? It doesn't need a break. So <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they haven't evolved to that, to that state. That's yet. right. You know, that's, that's the thing is they're going <laughs> to evolve to, you know, being the highest, highest efficiency. And then over time, you know, we'll see they'll evolve to be lazy too as well. So, <laughs> well, you know, let's, let's hope not. I think we've all seen Terminator, so we don't want Skynet running around. Do yeah. Yeah. We don't want that. So let's, let's stop. We don't want to be that. responsible for it anyway. Do we, Kevin? No, no. So we we will say that we're not taking any claims to that uh, right here on this recording. All right. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, so Balio, you know, you talked a little bit to us about what Balio does and, and how you guys kind of offer these automation solutions. And, you know, I'm curious um, from your perspective, you know, what what's the difference between Balio and, and some other robotics and automation companies that are out there? We'll be back after a quick break. You hear a lot about supply chains these days, because if the past couple years have taught us anything, it's that an efficient, well-managed supply chain is absolutely critical to keeping businesses successful and consumers happy. I'm Will Haywood, and I host a podcast called All Business, No Boundaries, where we talk about supply chains, how they work, what happens when they don't, and the innovations that are redefining what's possible in the world of logistics. Join me for insightful interviews with thought leaders and industry experts. We discuss how optimizing supply chains can break down the barriers that are holding businesses back. That's All Business, No Boundaries by DHL Supply Chain. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, I think the primary difference goes back to that fleet of vehicles that we have. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, primary benefit of that is when you go to put an AGV system in or an AMR system, uh, and the differences are becoming more and more gray and less black and white, You all, the customer runs the risk of buying something to do an island of automation. I'm sure you've heard that term before, right. yeah. where I'm just going to tie these two things together. A good example in warehousing is just the very simple old school, you offload a truck, You scan the pallets, you put them on the floor at the dock door, and then someone else comes along because typically that's a forklift, right? Mm -hmm. And then someone else comes along with typically a pallet jack, grabs those pallets, scans them again. The warehouse management system says, hey, take them to this aisle, and they'll either drop them at a zone in the aisle or maybe at an end cap Mm -hmm. and, and go away. So the typical purview of AGV systems was replicating that last, that middle portion. Right. You have scanned it, dropped it on the floor in a deep lane. The AGV now talks to the WMS, goes against it, puts it away. The The trap used to be there were companies that were really good at that portion. Hmm. And you would put that in. And then at some point you would start to think, wouldn't it be great if we could automate this reach truck or this VNA or maybe something else on the, you know, in another section of the plant? Yeah. And that's where Balio excels. We have that mm. full range of vehicle applications so that we can, you know, we're suitable, not just for today, mm. we're suitable for when you expand either, you know, further upstream or further downstream. And it's a pretty powerful message because you don't want to get caught with your pants down. Nobody does. Nobody right. wants to make a decision on something and then find out that, uh oh, 
Um, what do we do now? Yeah. And you've probably heard some of these media r- reports about an interoperability standard. There's mm-hmm. one in Europe that's quite strong that we are now working towards. Okay. And there's one in the U.S. that that AMR and HEV vendors are working on as well. Yeah, mass, but I think uh, the truth of the matter yeah. is most of those vendors don't really want to talk to each other. So I think customers are driving it. Yeah. But the the vendors, I think, would rather be on their own island because it controls kind of their destiny within a, a customer's facility. And I know that's not very customer centric, but it seems yeah. to be the way that if you had a competitive system and then you called another competitor and said, hey, I'd like to put this one in and I'd like your vehicles to work together. Mm. Many times they're going to say, nah, you really need to replace that thing in order to, you know, for these systems to work together. Mm. I think there will be a time before long that that competitor systems will work together. Yeah. But for now, the the real key to Balio's success has been the fact that we have everything from horizontal And, you know, the different types of vehicles really have different types of payback. So, for instance, we talked about Tuggers. Remember, I talked about the range of products. A Tugger is a fantastic tool for economy of scale. If you don't need anything with respect to uh, specialized slotting, Mm -hmm. you can put 10, 15 pallets on a Tugger and pull it around your facility for very low cost. I mean, you're getting 10 loads for the cost of one vehicle. Yeah, That's a great application, but it's not for everybody. Hmm. If you have applications that are floor to floor and you don't need the sophistication of picking that pallet up and placing it either on a conveyor or on a rack or, or anything like that, mm-hmm. then a pallet jack is a great solution because they're inexpensive pieces of equipment yeah. um, and easy to maintain and control. Once you start to go to picking from a conveyor or putting it in a rack, then you go to a counterbalance vehicle. Mm -hmm. Those are a little bit more expensive, but also more Swiss Army like in their um, application suitability. Then you start to talk about vertical and, you know, reach trucks and those things. So the, the breadth of our product line really has become, I think, our calling card. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's interesting to see. And, uh, you know, obviously I bring up a really interesting conversation there about the, the interoperability and, and companies being able to work together in the, the island of automation. I think it's pretty interesting because you do see, you know, companies that are, you know, solely focused on just one one type of movement and automating that one type of movement. I think that's where you kind of, you get restricted a little bit from a customer perspective of, you know, if I go with this, then, you know, what else can I use with this? If, if that company is not offering anything else at the time, or they're not offering something for my other, my other process that I need to automate. And, you know, you're, you're a hundred percent right. And that's Mm -hmm. why a lot of companies will look to integrators, right? You know, a third party to integrate, and tie together all of these pieces of, of equipment and not it, historically, it's not been AGVs, but mm-hmm. you know, the integrators forte is being able to supply maybe a conveyor on one end and ASRS on the other, yeah. and maybe an AGV in the middle and tying it all together. So, you know, integrators provide a, a, a very needed mm-hmm. middle portion to a project. However, when you start to talk about the same pieces of equipment, talking to each other, vendors start to become very stringent with respect to what they, who they'll talk to and who they won't. But I, Mm. I I almost guarantee that the new interoperability standards are going to push vendors to be able to talk to competitors. So it's coming. It really is Kevin. You'll see it before long. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think you're seeing it already with the, you mentioned the one in Europe and I know the one over here in mass robotics is doing is. Yep is taking off as well. So, so it'd be very interesting. Good for the customers, maybe not so good for competition <laughs> uh, amongst the <laughs> providers. Well, you know, there's, but. there's plenty of, there's plenty of opportunities for everybody. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about growth and those sorts of things in this industry, the mm-hmm. AGV, AMR industry. Right. My gut says that not even 1% of the forklift industry is automated. So yeah, if you take that number and extrapolate it out, there's plenty of growth available here for everybody to, to, oh, yeah. to be involved and to have a good solution. I think that, you know, new tech is developing. It still seems like to me 
the applications are still pretty simplistic, Kevin. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, you know, in the warehouses that you and I work in, it's still A to B transport. Right. I think that the the major milestones have become what the WMS packages in the middle can do with mm -hmm. respect to increasing the efficiency of manual drivers. So that has been a big driver for efficiency and the ability to move more product. Mm -hmm. That that new development has always been with AGVs because we have always known where the vehicles were and we always knew where the next orders were coming from. Mm. However, you know, software is the driver for nearly everything we do. And I think that those next real gains are going to come from the software, not necessarily hardware, a forklift, yeah. a forklift, a forklift, mm -hmm. sensor bases change, and we get new things, new functionality, especially around guidance. Yeah. But I think we will see more and more new developments around software, things mm -hmm. relating to traffic control and guidance and how vehicles can proactively understand where they are and then navigate a different fashion. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to see it for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I think it'd be interesting to see how it evolves. And, and like you mentioned, the 1% is only automated now. I mean, there's so much more room for things to grow and uh, for companies to kind of adopt these different technologies. It'd be really interesting to see like where, where the market continues to go as the years um, progress. So, so very interesting uh, conversation and very interesting to learn about Valio as well from you, John. So I want to thank you for coming on the show and, and talking to me. I'm curious, you know, how can people find out more information about Valio? Absolutely. The easiest way to find us is to find us at our website. So online, it's www.balio.com. Very simple to find. You know, we're, we're always happy to help. One of the things that we talk about that I'm really proud of is I offer free consulting. I, mm -hmm. I am a salesperson, I suppose, but, you know, I just love to talk to people. If you got a question, you want to sit down and just chat about an application. I've been in thousands mm -hmm. of warehouses. I've been doing this since 1992. Yeah. So look us up, find us. If you want to schedule just to sit down, I'm more than happy to sit down and talk with you. And by golly, if I can't help you, I bet I can point you in the right direction. All right. Awesome. And we'll put out that information at the new warehouse.com as well. So people can find it very easily. So John, once again, thank you for your time on the show today. You've been listening to the new warehouse podcast with Kevin Lawton. Subscribe and check us out online at thenewwarehouse.com. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you want more content from The New Warehouse, check out our new video series called All Hands on LinkedIn. Just search for The New Warehouse on LinkedIn and follow along.